Greetings. Welcome back to my Midnight Spook Show here on the Horror Metal Channel. I'm Lord Hellhound, and I figured I'd make a quick video before I went to work. Um, <clears throat> now, recently I made a video of my top 10 favorite horror sequels, and I did my top 10 least favorite horror sequels. So I figured I'd do a video about my this, sequels that I find the most underrated, the ones that uh, are better than most people would say. And originally I had a top 10 list, but some of them I didn't really uh, feel were that underrated, and I couldn't really think of too many, so I narrowed it down to five. And, um, you know, this is just my opinion, you know, maybe these movies do deserve the hate they get, but I, I, I don't really think so. And, uh, <clears throat> yes, I am going to leave out Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2, because I feel like that movie's just as revered as it is maligned, and a lot of people, a lot of my friends, especially in the horror hangouts group, bash it and hate on it, but I feel like a lot of people like it, too. It's a very divisive entry, even love it or hate it, so I'll go ahead and leave that out. You're welcome, Bronco Jolo and Andrew Bellina. <laughs> just kidding, guys. Much love. Uh, but anyway, let's go get down to it. Top five most underrated horror sequels. Now, all right, number five, Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge. Now, the thing about this movie is, I feel like it definitely does deserve a lot of the criticisms it gets. It's not a great movie, and it's definitely, in, in most ways, it's not a worthy follow-up to the original film, which is a masterpiece. Uh, one of Wes Craven's best movie, probably. Well, definitely, in my opinion, at least. Um, and yeah, this movie isn't really, definitely isn't on the level of that one at all. And I think Dream Warriors, which is part three of the following movie, is way better rocks over this one. So that was the, the better follow-up, in my opinion. But I do think this one's a little overlooked. And I do think, in a lot of ways, it's bashed for the wrong reasons. Don't get me wrong, it's highly flawed. I think it does deserve a lot of the hate it gets, um, in a lot of ways. But... Um, I feel like there is a lot to like here. It's a very dark entry. I feel like Freddy was still pretty scary in this one. It did show him a lot more than it did in the first movie. Um, also thought that Jesse, played by Mark Patton, was a pretty good, uh, protagonist. Hell, he's pretty much the only male, um, lead character that we have in the Freddy series, when you think about it. Um, even though he was kind of more like a scream queen. <laughs> you know, he's, he screamed a, a lot. Probably more than Nancy and Kirsten and... Uh, Kristen, sorry, and uh, Alice combined. Um, but yeah, he was cool. I liked him a lot. I think he was a good uh, protagonist, and um, yeah, I didn't think he was that bad. I thought, I thought he was pretty cool, and I like seeing his story. I also think, I always appreciate that they did something different. It wasn't Freddy invading people's nightmares in this. It wasn't dreams. It was Freddy trying to possess uh, Jesse's body um, while his girlfriend, played by Kim Myers, uh, tried to stop it from happening. Um, yeah, she looks exactly like... Uh, Meryl Streep, and everybody has already pointed that out, but, um, but, uh, but yeah, I think that was a good idea, it did something different, it kind of feels like Super Mario Brothers 2, it was totally different from the first movie, and I appreciate that, I think they could have went about it a little better, it could have been executed a little better, um, but I don't think that's a reason to hate the movie, that it did something different, it was creative, and it was something cool, and a lot of people criticize because, oh, Freddy's out in the real world at the end, and he's killing people in the real world, it's like, well, they already did the dream world, the first one, you know, and then, Part 3 does feel more like a proper follow-up, and it continues the story of the first one a little better than this one, but I, I like that they did something different. I think it's cool that he's possessing Jesse and um, <clears throat> making Jesse become evil and do all these horrible things. I think that was a good idea. I just don't think they... I think they could have went about it a lot better. Um, a lot of people also uh, criticize the gay undertones. There's a lot of homosexual subtext in this movie, which the director, Jack Shoulder, and the other makers feel said that they weren't aware that they were doing at the time. Kind of hard to believe. Um, I, I could be here all day talking about all the, the gay references, but, um, as they're admitted, but I never thought that was a problem with the movie at all. I mean, who cares? You know, I thought that, <laughs> hell, I thought a lot of it was hilarious, actually. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't mind that at all. I don't think that's a reason to hate the movie. You know, so what? Um, hell, Fright Night, one of my favorite movies of all time, had a lot of gay subtext in it. And I, that movie's freaking awesome. Um, yeah, that's, I don't, I don't understand why that's a negative. I've never understood that. You know, but, you know, whatever, teach their own. I guess people bash it for that reason, I'll never understand why. But anyway, yeah, I think this movie's a little unfairly maligned, though I do agree, I had this one pretty low in my list, because I do agree that it could have been a lot better, and there are definitely a lot of flaws with it. Um, but okay, I think I've spent enough time with that one, let's move on. Uh, number four, Scars of Dracula. Now, this entry, uh, is definitely overlooked compared to the others. And the thing is, you know, it, I think everybody agrees that it's better than Dracula A.D. 1972 and Satanic Rites of Dracula and all that. 
Um, but I feel like a lot of people will still bash this one for some reason. I'll never understand why. The thing I love about this movie is Christopher Lee as Count Dracula, reprising his role from the other films, gets a lot of screen time and a lot of dialogue. Um, some of the other sequels, he barely spoke. He hardly had any lines. Hell, in Prince of Darkness, which is a movie that's highly revered and overly praised, um, well, not overly. I, I agree with that. I think it's a great movie. He doesn't have any dialogue at all. He has no lines. I feel like that doesn't work for Dracula. There are certain horror characters like Jason Voorhees, Michael Myers, and maybe Frankenstein's monster that probably should be silent and shouldn't talk. Um, I actually like when Frankenstein's monster talks, though, in Bride of Frankenstein. Um, but yeah, a lot of them should be silent. Um, but I feel like Dracula is not one of them. He works better when he has dialogue and comes across as charming and suave and, and debonair and, you know, kind of... <clears throat> kind of charms you before he kills you and drinks your blood. I think that's what makes him so scary, um, you know, and he can be sinister and evil too. Chris really, really pulled off both sides of the character very well. He, you know, he could be the more charismatic, uh, soft-spoken gentleman, and he could be the evil, blood-sucking leech on two legs with his fangs dripping blood, an evil, blood-sucking creature of the night. He pulled off both very well, and I, but I prefer when he talks. I prefer when he has lines, and he has a lot of screen time in this one. Yeah, some of the other sequels, we barely saw any of them, and in fact, some of them, I think they're, like, he'd just become available, and they filmed, like, around the, the fact that he had just become available, and, like, he had very little scenes. I don't care for that. I like him to have a lot of screen time. I like him to be in the movie a lot. So, Prince of Darkness, which is regarded as one of the best, he has no lines. And I think that's a much better movie, but I think this one has a better Dracula, because he's in it a lot more. Um, so, yeah, I'll never understand why people uh, hate on this one, because I think it's one of the better entries in the Hammer Dracula series. I absolutely love it, and I don't understand the hate it gets. Dracula's in it a lot. What more can you ask for? Christopher Lee's great. I want to see more of him. Um, all right, anyway, moving on. Um, number three. Pet Cemetery 2. Now, don't get me wrong, this movie is highly flawed, and it's definitely not as good as the original. Um, it's not as uh, dark, scary, or suspenseful. Um, but I feel like the original, well, a great movie and a great adaption of the book uh, by Stephen King, of course. This movie had nothing to do with Stephen King, really. Um, the original um, is definitely a lot scarier, definitely, um, but it kind of leaves me with kind of a depressing feeling. It, it, like, when I watch it, I, you know, the themes of guilt and grief, which are done very well and prevalent in the movie, um, are definitely very powerful. And the original is very, very serious and very grounded and very gritty and very well done. Um, but when I want to have a good time and, you know, turn my brain off for a few hours, just have a blast and laugh, I'll watch this movie. And I find myself reaching for this one a little more. I do think the original is far better. Um, this one's definitely more entertaining. Now, this one is one of those sequels that ups the gore and the action and the laughs. Uh, it's pretty much a horror comedy, but I feel like there's still enough horror and enough disturbing subject matter to qualify as a serious horror movie as well. There's definitely the, those themes of grief and guilt and stuff, um, just like the first movie. Maybe not as, as, as prevalent, but, um, they're there. And, uh, <clears throat> again, this movie's a blast. I love watching it. It's hilarious. It's a lot of fun. Clancy Brown is a badass. He is great. He rocks the movie. He owns the freaking movie. Edward Furlong, you know, from Terminator 2 and American History X is great here. Um, very, uh, very compelling lead character. Anthony Edwards, who I love for Revenge of the Nerds, plays a really serious role here as his dad. Um, and yeah, they go through the movie very depressed and grief-stricken because of Jeff's mother dying. I think that was done very well. Um, but... There's a lot of, like, a lot of really silly, over-the-top, campy moments, too, that really balance it out. So, yeah, I do think this movie's a lot more entertaining than the first one. Um, although, yeah, it's not as sophisticated, it's not as scary, but I don't think it deserves the hate it gets. It's a fun movie. It's like a horror comedy, and a lot of people say, what's wrong with you? You like Pet Cemetery too? Yeah, I love it. It's, I love it in a different way from the first one. You can't compare it to the original, because it's really not a, really a proper sequel. I mean, yeah, the Indian burial grounds there, they mention the Creed family, but really, it's a whole new story with whole new characters, so... Um, but yeah, I think it's unfairly criticized and overlooked. I think it's a very fun movie. It's stupid, it's ridiculous, but it's a, it's a blast. It's a lot of fun. I definitely recommend it. Um, but yeah, if you think it's just going to be a repeat of the first movie and be all dark and suspenseful and scary, then yeah, that's, you're going to be disappointed because this movie is something, something different. It's more of a movie to just enjoy and have a good time. It leaves me with a pleased, uh, fun feeling. It leaves me in a good mood. I feel empowered after I watch it and, you know... And, you know, I'm usually laughing after I finish the movie and, and instead of being, you know, kind of, <laughs> um, not really depressed, but, you know, kind of put in a more of a downbeat mood from the first movie, which does its job very well and is better overall. Um, but anyway, okay, I think I spent enough time on that. Um, you know, I want to I watch a movie that makes me feel good, you know, one that makes me feel bad. 
But, uh, but Pet Cemetery, the original, is a far better movie, like I said. All right, anyway, moving on. I think I spent enough time on that. Uh, number two, Brad 13, part eight, Jason Takes Manhattan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not enough of it takes place in the city of, of New York, New York City, and uh, Jason teleports. Those are literally the only two criticisms I ever hear about this movie. Does that mean it's a bad movie? Because the cover um, is kind of false advertising because it's not in uh, Manhattan enough. No, I don't think so. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, I would have loved Jason being in the city a lot more. But I feel like once he finally got to the city, it was worth the wait, and they milked it for all it's worth. We got to see him in the sub day, subway station and in Times Square, and we saw the Statue of Liberty, you know, we saw him in a diner, we saw him on top of buildings. They, they, they definitely went all, all the way with it. We saw him in the sewer. Um, so we did get a lot of the city. It just wasn't enough, and I would have appreciated less time on the boat, more time in the city. But at least they got away from Camp Crystal Lake. At least it wasn't the same thing over and over again. That's where all the people that criticized some of the Friday 13 sequels literally wanted to make them the wanted them to make the exact same movie over and over and over again. It's the same people who bashed Part Seven. Oh, there's a telekinetic girl in it. I don't like it. They did something different. They did something refreshing. I'm not into it. Come on, guys. They had to do something different after all these sequels. Oh, just this, just watch the other movies. It's the same movie ever. It is flawed. There are some stupid things. Really, the Jason teleporting thing, I think people exaggerate. There's only two scenes I can think of where it seems like he blatantly warps from one place to another. Uh, but you could say he was just running really fast. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, but really, guys, come on. Jason's already an unrealistic character. I'm not saying they should break the rules so much that he should be a demonic worm that jumps from body to body and can only be killed by one of his long lost siblings. I'm not saying that at all. <laughs> but at the same time, these movies aren't Shakespeare. It's okay for them to, you know, break the rules a little bit. He was already inconsistent as hell in the first few movies anyway. He went from having a full head of hair and a beard in part two from being completely bald and clean shaven in the third film, being a lot taller and more muscular. So, I mean, there's always inconsistencies. Um, but yeah, again, there's a lot of stupid things. The ending is particularly dumb. Jason's look unmasked is really stupid, but it has a lot of my favorite moments too. Like when he kicks the radio and the thugs are about to beat him up and he lifts his mask up and like oh it's cool man it's cool then when he first sees the sign it was like a, like a hockey player and he's like what because you know, he wears the hockey mask of course um also like Rennie played by Jensen Dagg I think she was a good uh lead character um you know I, I like all the characters this some some good kills too you know um I think it was kind of heavily censored much like part seven I would have appreciated some of the gore being more intact but it wasn't nearly as butchered as that movie's you know with the censorship so there's still a lot of good moments. Yeah, it's, it is ridiculous. It's not one of the better ear entries in the series, but I don't think it deserves the hate it gets either. A lot of people say this is the worst Jason movie. I couldn't disagree more. Um, far from it, you know. But anyway, yeah. Friday 30 Part 8. Very underrated. All right, now, number one most underrated horror sequel is Friday 13 Part 5, A New Beginning. I know you're thinking, hey, you had two Jason movies on the list. Don't usually differ differentiate and have only one entry per series. I feel like these deserve their own entry. They had to both make the list. Now, where Friday the 13th Part 8 is hated because Jason wasn't in Manhattan enough, this one's hated because Jason's not in the movie at all. He's not the killer. Spoiler alert! Um, now, yeah, that is a huge drag. That is a bummer. It would have been way better if Jason was the killer, and it does really drag the movie down. Um, I hate the fact that he's not the killer. I despise that. I think it would have been way better. But... Aside from that, this movie's great. It has some of the best kills, some of the best gore, even though it was censored. Um, some of the best nudity by far. Um, you know, I'm not really, I don't really care about that, but, you know, most horror fans do. Um, I don't really think that determines what makes a good movie or not. But it's a staple of the Jason series, so, you know, there you go. Um, some of the best characters, too. Um, Tommy Jarvis is played by John Shepard. He's actually my least favorite Tommy. I like Corey Feldman and Tom Matthews better, but I think he plays off the more tortured soul, traumatic, post-traumatic uh, experience Tommy um, the best. Other than, you know, we, we really get to see how, how he's haunted by memories of Jason. He's plagued by those nightmares, and he really pulls that off really well. Um, I think so. He did a good job. Again, I don't like him quite as much as the other two, but I think he was kind of the most grounded and realistic, and in some ways the most interesting. Um, so I think he brought a lot to the table. Um, Tom Morga, who plays, well, Jason, even though um, he's actually Roy Burns, who's played by Dick Wean, a totally different actor, um, does a good job as, as not Jason. Um, and yeah, again, this one has some of the most kills, some of the best, most creative kills, an awesome soundtrack, really hilarious, over-the-top characters. And I just gotta say, not, J having, not, not uh, having omitted Jason aside, which is a big drag. This one is by far the most entertaining one in the whole series. This one is the most fun. Um, I enjoy it so much. Um, it gets a lot of laughs out of me. And yeah, it does suck that Jason's not the killer. And there's some other stupid things too that I won't get into. I've already reviewed this movie. I talk about it at, le at length. 
before. Um, yeah, there are some things that I wouldn't have done had I made the movie, but I think I still think that Danny Steinman and company did a good job with it. And if Jason had been in it, this would have easily been one of the best entries. Um, so yeah, it is the most amusing, and it came out in my favorite year, 1985, and it definitely has that 80s feel, of course, and it's just so, so much fun. I love this movie. I don't care what anybody says. So yeah. These are not nearly as bad as I said. But then again, I'm biased because I like every movie in the Jason series. I think they're all great in different ways. Some are better than the others. Some had some really stupid things in them. But come on, guys. These movies aren't Shakespeare. <laughs> Alright, guys. Well, those are my top five underrated sequels. Maybe I'll make another video sometime down the line with more underrated sequels. Feel free to make your own video. Um, in fact, you can even say I tagged you. Tell them Lord Hellhound sent you. Um, I'd love to see what you guys think are uh, some of the most underrated horror sequels. Maybe just some of the most underrated horror movies in general. So, uh... Feel free to do that. All right, guys, I'm Hellhound. Thank you for watching. Until next time, keep it horror.